Alhamdulillah. Was salat was salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr. Inna al-insan lafi khusr. Illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati. Wa tawasaw bil haqq wa tawasaw bil sabr. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yusalli amri. Wa halu al-uqdata min lisani hafka wa kawli. I welcome all the viewers of the Peach TV Network, the Peach TV English, the Peach TV Urdu, the Peach TV Bangla, and the Peach TV Chinese, as well as my four social media platforms, which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, and Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. <clears throat> I welcome all of you to this program. Ask Dr. Zakir, Season 4, Session 5. Here in this program, you are most welcome, you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have posed you and you are unable to reply or any question that you find on the media which you require reply to this is the opportunity you are most welcome to ask your question on any of my four social media platforms but the best would be sending it as a text message to the WhatsApp mentioning your question in brief along with your name your profession and the city and country of origin to WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero and this WhatsApp number is new and started from the last session and it's easy to remember plus six zero is the Malaysian code in the starting in the start of the number is six zero at the ending again is six zero in between is double one two one double three double three easy to remember you're most welcome to text your questions in brief along with mentioning your name your profession the city and country of origin to the whatsapp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero we'll first take the question that has come on the whatsapp <clears throat> the first question is from Humaira from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Profession student. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sir, how are you? I am a student of the zoology department. Before choosing this department, I had no idea that I would have to draw different kinds of animal figures in my practicals. I came to know that drawing any kind of animal figure is completely forbidden in Islam. I tried to follow all of your lectures, rules of our religion and pray five times a day. But now, knowing the fact, I am really worried about my studies. My question is, what should I do as a Muslim? Am I being a sinner for doing this? Please give me some advice. It will be really helpful for me. Thank you. A similar question is asked by Sultan Sayyid from London, UK. I am aware that drawing pictures and images of living things is prohibited in Islam. Is there any exception for educational purposes? The question asked basically is that is it permitted to draw images of animals or pictures of animals for educational purpose or because a person is studying zoology?
it is mentioned in Sai Muslim, volume number 5, hadith number 5535, that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said that anyone who makes images, he will be punished on the day of resurrection. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him to put life in the images. A similar hadith is mentioned in Sai Muslim, volume number 4, hadith number 5540, where the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said that a person who makes images will be put into the hellfire. And for every image he has made, a soul will be created who will keep on punishing him, will keep on punishing him in hell. And the Prophet continued and said that if you want to make images, make of trees and inanimate objects. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sai Muslim, word number 5, hadith number 5541, that Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, once a man approaches him and tells him that I keep on making images. So Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, kept his hand on the person and told him that the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said that anyone who makes images on the day of resurrection, Allah will ask him to put soul into that image and no one will be able to do it. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, poem number 3, hadith number 2105. The Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet. Once she buys a cushion having images. And the Prophet, when he's about to enter the house, he sees and he gets very angry. And he does not enter the house. Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she asks that, what have I done? Have I sinned? And the Prophet said that, what are those cushions? So she replies, I bought these cushions for you to sit on. Then the Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish the person who makes images and will ask him to put life into it. And the Prophet says that angels do not enter a house which has got images. So based on all these hadith, which are there in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim and various other hadith, The scholars of Islam, they say that it is forbidden in Islam to build any images of any living creatures which have got soul. Like human beings, animals, birds, etc. But it is permitted to make images of inanimate things like mountain, car, table, chair or even trees. Now, science hasn't advanced so far today to make us understand which living creatures have got soul. But the focus say that you cannot make images of the human beings, the animals and birds. So, in order to know what is permitted and what is prohibited, today science tells us that the living beings have been divided into six kingdoms. The first is the animal kingdom, the second is the plant kingdom, third is the fungi, fourth is protesta, fifth is astria and sixth is the bacteria. Some people have divided into five, the last two they have clubbed it together and called it as monera. So there are totally five or six kingdoms in the living beings and the highest is the animal kingdom. Now normally the question is asked that he knows that it is not permitted to make images of all living beings. This is not correct. Islam doesn't prohibit to make images of all living creatures. It prohibits to make images of living creatures which have a soul. What is permitted is inanimate 
objects, that is non-living things, and living things we don't have a soul, like tree. So based on science, since the plant kingdom is number two, I also believe that all the other kingdoms in the living beings below the plant is also permitted. So what is prohibited is those living creatures which have got soul and I believe they will only fall in the, under the animal kingdom. So I do believe that it's permitted besides plants, you can make images of fungi, you can make bacteria. People ask, can you make an image or a drawing of the coronavirus? Yes. Surely coronavirus doesn't have a soul. So you can make images of all the other living creatures besides the animal kingdom. This is confirmed. Now, science hasn't advanced so much to let us know whether all the living creatures in the animal kingdom have a soul or not. What the Fukahs have said, it is very clear that you cannot make images of the of human beings, of the animals, of the birds, and but not including the fish, that is the sea life, insects, etc. Today, science tells us there are 8.7 million species only in the animal kingdom, out of which only 15% is known to us. At present, they have listed 953,434 species in the animal kingdom, that is less than a million, and they are finding more and more. But to be safe, I believe that since we don't know which of the animal kingdom have got soul or not, it is safe not to make any images paintings or pictures or sculptures or idols of anything in the animal kingdom that is the safest. Besides that, in all the, all the other kingdoms which are below the animal kingdom like plants, fungi, bacteria, virus, no problem. As well as the inanimate objects. This is the ruling. Now coming to the question that is it permitted to make images or paintings or pictures for educational purpose or because a person is studying zoology. Even for educational purposes, the Fokahas and the Islamic scholars, they say it is not permitted. However, Even for educational purposes, it is generally not permitted to make images or sketches or diagram of living creatures which have got soul like human beings, animals, birds, insects, sea life, that is the fish etc. But if these beings do not have the features that is there in the face, like the nose, eyes, mouth, then the Fukaha says that it is permitted. If you draw an image of an animal without showing the features, or of a human being, without showing the features of the nose, of the mouth, of the eyes, it is permitted, it will not be counted as a complete image and this is not haram. Or if you make an image without the head, that is decapitated, even that is permitted. What is prohibited is a living creature which has a soul like human beings, animals, birds, fish, insect, with detail. So if you draw only an arm, it is permitted, only a leg, it is permitted, but the complete human being with all the details not permitted. But if you draw an illustration without showing the details of the face, like the eyes, the nose, or the mouth, the Foucault says, it is permitted. So for educational purposes, if you make illustrations, if you make sketches without showing the details of the face, it is permitted. Or showing a part of the body, it is permitted. But detailed diagram or sketches or painting or, or in images, it is prohibited. There are very few exceptions. For example, if there is a crime which is committed, and if there is a witness who has seen the criminal and if the police wants to know who is the criminal then what they do they are permitted 
to get a person who is an expert in making sketches or making portraits and based on the information given by the witness they ask the witness how is the nose of the person how is the eyes what is the complexion based on that the person who is an expert in making portrait he draws and this purpose it is permitted because we want to catch the criminal and see to it that justice is done so in such cases where you have to catch the criminal if the witness describes the criminal in detail and someone draws the portrait or or the picture of the person who's a criminal for this purpose in exceptional case it is permitted or it can be that a doctor or a medical student is learning about the human body and to save lives of the patient there may be a sculpture of a human body with all the details in this case because he is being trained to save the human life in such cases it is permitted but generally in the school etc the muslim student should avoid making detailed images if required they can do sketches and illustration without showing the details of the face or draw the animal without the head what is permitted they can make scenery they can make trees they can make mountains they can make the sky this is permitted so even for educational purposes you should be careful because making Im images is a major sin and a beloved prophet said he will be one of the person who will be severely punished an imam adhabi in his book the kabair major sin he lists making images or sculpture or painting as sin number 48 so because it's a major sin we should not take it lightly and the muslim should not be involved in any way in making a detailed picture or image of a human being or animal or bird or insect or fish etc hope that answers the question <clears throat> the next question assalamu alaikum salman khatri from manchester uk is it permissible for a muslim to practice as a lawyer in a non muslim country whose laws are man made and not according to sharia a similar question is asked by the next questioner Assalamu alaikum Dr Zakir my name is Muhammad Suleiman I am from Bangladesh I am a student a lawyer knows his client well his client may be a criminal or innocent if the client is a criminal is it permissible in Islam to defend a criminal in court There are basically two questions asked. One is that is it permissible for a Muslim to practice the profession of a lawyer in a non-Muslim country in which the laws are man-made and they are not according to the Islamic Sharia? And the second question is, can a Muslim lawyer defend a criminal? As far as the first question is concerned, that per se. it is permitted for a muslim to practice a, as a lawyer even in a non muslim country even though the laws are man made because the laws are not made by him the laws are made by somebody else and he is not responsible for that law but if he has to protect someone or support someone or help someone based on the verse of the quran of surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 2 that help one another help each other in bir and taqwa that means help each other in righteousness and good deeds so based on this according to the scholars per se it is permitted for a muslim to practice law 
even in a non-Muslim condition, even in a non-Muslim country, but there are some conditions which we'll come to it later on. As far as the second question is concerned, that can a Muslim lawyer defend a criminal? Defending a criminal and a person who has done a crime is not allowed in Islam. The same verse of the Quran of Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 2, towards the end, when it says, help each other and bir and taqwa in virtue and righteousness, it continues and says that do not help one another in sin and in transgression. So if you are supporting someone for a crime or someone who has done something haram, then you are supporting him in sin and transgression which is not permitted. So for a Muslim lawyer, if he knows his client has done a crime, has robbed or has killed someone or whatever crime is done which is not permitted by law or which is not permitted in Sharia, it is not permitted for him to fight his case. There may be exceptions that the crime is not a crime according to Islam and is a crime according to the law of that country. So in such cases, it's okay. It's a crime according to the law of the country, but not a crime according to Sharia. Then the Muslim lawyer can fight the case, it's permitted. But otherwise, generally, if the person has done a sin or broken the law, which is against the Sharia, and if he knows he's broken the law, he cannot support him, he cannot defend him. And the Quran further says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 105, that be not an advocate of a person who betrays the trust. And the verse continues. It says further, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 107, that confined not, struggle not for a person who betrays his own self. For Allah loves not those who give in to injustice and crime. So based on these two verses of the Quran also, you cannot support a person who is involved in crime or injustice. You cannot support someone who has betrayed the trust. And our beloved Prophet said, it mentions Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, hadith number 177, that the Prophet said that if you see anything which is wrong, you should stop it or change it with your hand. If you cannot, then change it with the tongue. If you cannot, then curse in your heart and agree it is wrong. Then you will be the lowest level of a believer, a moment. So if you know your client has done something wrong, you cannot support him. What you can guide him is give yourself up, agree with your mistake or take the punishment. What you can do if he agrees with the mistake, then you can fight his case saying he has done a sin and you can request the judge to give him less punishment. That is permitted. If he has agreed with his mistake, you as a lawyer can present him saying he has done the sin but please give him lesser punishment, that is permitted. But to prove that he has not done the sin or has not done the crime, that is prohibited. So for a lawyer, it's very important that if he's practicing, whether in a country which is a non-Muslim country, which has got man-made laws, or whether for a lawyer in a Muslim country following the Sharia, there are a few things which are very important to be noted. As a lawyer, you cannot fight a case of a person who's a criminal or a person who's done a sin. It's not permitted. You cannot defend him. As per the Quran, Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 2, Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 105 and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 107. Second, you cannot fight for someone who's trying to deceitfully usurp the rights of some other human being. It's not permitted. Point number 3, you cannot fight a case and use false witnesses, make false evidence just to win his case. All these are prohibited. So as a lawyer, you have to be careful that you have to only select those cases which are on the haq, which are on the truth, and the person is actually innocent. And number two, you should not use deceit or wrong evidence or false evidence or lies to win your argument. Normally, whenever a case takes place, Either the person is on the right or is on the wrong. Is on the truth or is on the falsehood. And 
there are two lawyers fighting the case. One is for the person, one is against the person. So safely you can say always, 50% of the time on average, the lawyer is fighting a case of a person who is in the wrong. And approximately 50% of the time where the lawyer is fighting for a person who is on the haq. So if you are a Muslim lawyer, you will have to realize that you cannot take all the cases, irrespective of whether you are fighting or you are practicing as a lawyer in a Muslim country or in a non-Muslim country. All your clients should be genuine. Just because you are good with the law, you are good with debating, you are good with arguing, you cannot take up a case where he has done a crime and with your skills prove him innocent, that is haram. Besides he getting a sin, even you will be getting a sin because you are supporting someone who is a criminal and this is not accepted in Islam. So you should understand that if you are taking up the profession of being a lawyer, on average 50% of the cases you will not be able to accept. So if you think you are going to become a lawyer only for earning money, my advice to you would be don't become a lawyer. If you know that you are going to be on the haq, you are going to be on the truth and you see to it that you will refuse all the cases in which the client is a criminal or the client is not on the haq because almost all the times the lawyer knows very well before you fight the case for a client whether the client is a criminal or not, whether the client is on the haq or not and then he tries to win the case irrespective whether he is a criminal or not. So as a Muslim lawyer you in no way can defend a person who is a criminal you should have the, the guts and you should have the heart to give up a case even if you know that you can win his case if he is in the wrong you cannot. You can only fight a case in which he is on the truth and if he has not done any crime. Today we find that most of the top lawyers who are good in arguing and presenting the case they can even win and prove a person who is a criminal as an innocent person. And the more you can do this, higher is your fees. That is the reason you find that most of these criminals and those who have done wrong, they have the best of lawyers who are very good with arguing. This is not permitted in Islam. And I remember during school days and during my days in college, I was an expert in arguing. And when we used to have discussions or debates among friends, I could prove black as white, I could prove white as black and I was expert in debating. After I met Sheikh Ahmed Dida in 1987 and I got involved in the field of Dawa, now I am using these skills Alhamdulillah for defending Islam. As far as defending Islam is concerned, Alhamdulillah, you don't have to bother at all because if it's a verse of the Quran, it's, if it's a part of a Sahih Hadith, as a Muslim we believe it's a Haqq. So, we don't have to at all worry whether should we defend it or not. We have to defend it. With all your struggle, your jihad, your intelligence, because it's the haq. In other cases, you may not know whether your client is a criminal or not. So, Alhamdulillah, after I met Sheikh Ahmed Dida, I got involved in the field of Dawa and I've become a lawyer for Islam. And it has become my passion. It has uh, become my way of life of defending Islam against those people who attack Islam. And Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has helped and has really blessed, MashaAllah. That's when we give a training program, in the Dawa training program, we show the skills of debating. And in skills of debating, we may do a mock debate where two groups, one group is saying that the world is spherical, the other group is saying that the world is flat and with our skills we can show that even if what is false we can prove it right because of skills. We should not do this in life but in training we can. One group says 2 plus is equal to 4, the other group says 2 plus 2 is not equal to 4 and if you have the debating skills you can win irrespective of which side you are. So this is the training session. But we tell them, 
never use the skills for defending anything which is wrong. And alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, there's nothing better than being a lawyer for the cause of Islam, that is being a da'i, and that is the best profession that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41. Verse number 33, where Allah says that Waman Ahsan Nukala Mimman Doila Lahi Wa Amilu Sali Hau Wakala Inna Nimna Muslimi. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I'm a Muslim? <coughs> we have on the Facebook Zakaria Zaki Chen Fung In Islam I am a lawyer Mumin Rashid Chaudhary Afridi Mondal I am a lawyer MashaAllah we have many lawyers listening Hope you take advice That secret that your clients are on the haq Taheed Smart Sele Event <coughs> Andrea Hovis Kite. Is there someone I can talk to about converting? In English, I have so many questions. Uh, Andrea Hovis Kite, I would request you that you are most welcome to send your question on the WhatsApp message. That is plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. If you want, you can even go on the Facebook and see the number there and you can surely call there and inshallah somebody may attend Sajid Abbas mashallah Afridi Mondal Abdul Azim assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam Iman Hassan I love you sir I love you too Dhananjay Singh Abu Bakr Goni Shah Farhan Labib Aman Habibur Rahman Tahmid Zarif Saima Ahmed Akram Khan Zakaria Zaki Kakam Sabar, Allah Akbar, Muhammad Arfin Reza, many are saying salams. Wa alaikum salam to all of you and Jazakallah for all your duas. On the YouTube we have Akari Bada, Hashir Uzair, Hazur Ahmad, Musab Sharif, Mujbur Rahim, Muhammad Asif, Akari Bada, Jaharul Islam, Nayam Ahmad, Zahid Shahir, Mazharul Islam, Musab Sharif, Fahad Purush Sheikh Habib Farhat Ansari Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam Jadakallah for all your duas The question posed on the YouTube is Rimsha Rafi.
कैन प्रेग्नेंट वुमेन प्रे सलाह वाइल सिटिंग एज फार एज प्रेइंग सलाह इज कंसर्न इफ अ पर्सन इज हेल्दी ही शुड प्रे एज द प्रेयर हैज बीन टॉट बाइबल आई प्रॉफिट बट इफ अ पर्सन इज सिक और हैज अ मेडिकल प्रॉब्लम इट इज परफेक्टली परमिटेड फॉर हिम टू सिट डाउन एंड प्रे एज अल्लाह से इज इन द कुरान इन सोनिसा चैप्टर फोर वन हंड्रेड एंड वन हंड्रेड एंड टू दैट यू कैन प्रे वाइल स्टैंडिंग यू कैन प्रे वाइल सिटिंग वाइल लाइंग इट्स परमिटेड सो इफ यू हैव अ प्रॉब्लम इफ यू आर प्रेगनेंट एंड इफ यू फील यू कैन नॉट स्टैंड एंड यू वॉन्ट टू you are more comfortable sitting and praying it's perfectly permitted if you have a knee problem and if you cannot do sujood or go down and sit on the chair if it's a medical problem where it's difficult and painful for a person to do all the postures in the sala then it's very well perfected you can pray while sitting if you are so sick that you cannot sit down you can even pray pray while lying all these are permitted The next question Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh My name is Muhammad Musaddiq I am from Maharashtra India I am 17 years old As we know IPL IPL is the Indian Premier League it's a cricket uh tournament that takes place in India If as we know IPL is going on so there are many apps from which we can earn money by predicting the future score of so and so team will win etc is this thing related to gambling and is it permissible in islam can i earn money from it predicting whether any team will win in a particular type of sport whether it be cricket whether it be football predicting and if you are right you get money this comes under the category of gambling that you pay a particular amount of money and if your prediction comes right you may get 5 times you may get 10 times depending upon what has been told this is nothing but gambling it is nothing but gambling and allah says in the quran in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 90 allah says ya ayyuhal ladina amanu o you believe in al khamr wal maisur most certainly intoxicants and gambling wal ansabu wal azlamu dedication of stones divination of arrows rich sum min amli shaitan rich sum min amli shaitan these are certain thanibur fast tanibu la allakum tafluhun fast tanibu la allakum tuflihun abstain from this thanibur that you may prosper so quran clearly said that intoxicants gambling dedication of stones divination of arrows all these are satan's handiwork abstain from it that you may prosper so such type of events where you have to put money and you get a bigger amount if you turn out to be right if your prediction turns out to be right it is nothing but gambling and it is prohibited as far as getting involved in sports in which the prizes are given you don't have to put any money but if you take part in a sport and if prizes are given In this case our beloved prophet said that prizes in terms of money can only be given in cases of horse racing or camel racing or archery because all these make a person more fit for doing jihad for fighting so scholars have said that if you take part in any sports which involve and helps you in making yourself fit for jihad it is permitted or for making you improve in your religion like competitions of kirat or hadith competition or the seera competition so these competition will get you closer to islam or makes you more fit like archery horse riding camel racing more fit to do jihad is permitted but those sports which doesn't benefit you at all in terms of jihad or doesn't benefit you it come closer to islam like cricket etc so even doing competition the first thing and winning prizes for such thing even though it's not considered as gambling it is not permitted in islam because winning prizes of such competition such sports we don't get you closer to the deen 
डोंट मेक यू मूव फिट फॉर जैज ऑल्सो इट इज प्रोहेबिटेड होप द आंसर क्वेश्चन The next question. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik sir. I am from Bangladesh. In profession, I am a textile engineer. I am married for last one year. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa taala has given me a perfect person as my life partner. I wanted to talk with you directly for some nasiha. Although I am belonging to a Muslim family, my Islamic knowledge is very poor. I am only a namesake Muslim. I want to make myself a true Muslim so that I may die with faith. After 26 years of life, I have realized that in these 26 years, my book of virtue is zero. And I understand from the knowledge of good and evil that I have committed many sins. These sins are constantly haunting me. Fear of death is rampant. If I die now, I have nothing to take with me. I would like to share with you some more things which may not be possible in the message. I know there are many books of Hadith, there are many books of Islam, but it may take a long time to find out the necessary Hadith to atone for my sins. You know a lot about Islam. If you can help me by knowing the sins I have committed, how can I atone my sins? And when Allah takes me to Him, I can go to Him with full faith. I am surrounded by sins. There is just sin spread all around. How do I get out of here? Please, I am requesting you to help me out. The brother from Bangladesh, who is a textile engineer, he has mentioned that he's 26 years old and he's involved in a lot of sins and he has realized it is wrong and he wants to atone for them. How will he come to know which are the sins and how should he atone for it? The sins can be broadly classified into major sins and minor sins. There are two types of sins. As far as the minor sins are concerned, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that Praying five times daily, or praying one Juma to the other Juma, or fasting from Ramzan from, Ram, from, from one Ramzan to the other Ramzan, it washes away your sins. Here the Prophet is referring to minor sins, not the major sins. So if you pass, so if you pray five times a day and you keep on praying, inshallah your minor sins would be forgiven. If you pray Juma, one Juma to the next Juma, inshallah Allah will forgive all your other sins in between these two Juma. Or if you fast from one Ramadan to the next Ramadan, fast the full month of Ramadan, then fast the next Ramadan, inshallah Allah will forgive your sins in the month of Ramadan. And there are various hadith. Our beloved Prophet also said that if you fast during Muharram, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Ashura, on the 10th of Muharram, then Allah will forgive your sins of one year of the previous year, complete year. Our beloved Prophet also said that if you fast on the day of Arafah, Allah will forgive your sin of the previous year as well as the sin of the coming year. Now all these sins that the Prophet is talking about forgiveness, it is talking about minor sin, not the major sin. So number one brother for me, to give you advice, as you have mentioned that you are involved in various sins and you are surrounded by sins, Number one, you should try and identify which are your major sins. Major sin is a sin which has been called a major sin, either in the Quran or the Hadith, number one. Number two, it is a sin for which the punishment is mentioned in this world. Or it's a sin for which punishment is mentioned in the next life. In the hereafter. Fourth, it is a sin which Allah and His Messenger has cursed you. Or fifth, it's a sin 
विच विल पुट यू इन टू द हेल्प फायर सो इफ इट फॉल्स अंडर एनी ऑफ दीज फाइव क्राइटेरिया इट इज कॉल्ड एज मेजर सिन एंड अकॉर्डिंग टू हदीत अफ इबन अब्बास में लाभ यू सिम अब लव इट पॉट मसलम सेड दैट देर आर सेवन मेजर सिन बट सेवेंटी इज मोर क्लोजर टू सेवन सो देर आर स्कॉलर्स ऑफ आइडेंटिफाइड दैट विच विल बी दीज मेजर सिंस सम आर मैंशन एज मेजर सिंस इन हदीत और कुरान विच इज विदाउट डाउट बट सम इज नॉट मैंशन एज मेजर सिंह बट द पनिशमेंट इज मैंशन टू स्कॉलर सेज विद दीज आर मेजर सिंस दिस अ बुक रिटन बाई इमाम अदाबी कॉल्ड एस कबायर और मेजर सिंस and he lists the 70 major sins in order according to the quran and hadith what he feels is number 1 right up to number 70 and he puts number 1 as shirk based on the verse of the quran or surah nisa chapter 4 48 and surah nisa chapter 4 verse 116 that allah if he pleases he will forgive any sin but the sin of shirk he will not forgive so if a person dies as a mushrik without repenting or without rectifying he is 100% going to be in hell forever So number one sin, major sin, is shirk. Number two, according to Imam Adabi, is murder. Number three is black magic or witchcraft or sorcery. Number four is not offering salah. Number five is not giving zakat if you have to give zakat. Number six, not fasting in the month of Ramadan if you are supposed to fast if you have, if you are. healthy and if you are adult and if it comes saying don't fast that is sin number major sin number 6 major sin number 7 is not performing hajj if you are supposed to perform hajj if allah has given you the health and the wealth to perform hajj and if you don't perform it is a major sin major sin number 8 is disrespect and disobedience to your parents number 9 is abandoning your relatives number 10 is fornication and adultery number 11 is homosexuality and sodomy number 12 is giving or taking of interest that is riba usury number 13 is usurping the wealth of the orphans number 14 is lying against allah and his messenger number 15 is running running away from the battlefield Number sixteen is deceit, wrongfulness, and oppression by a ruler. <clears throat> Number seventeen is being arrogant. Number eighteen is bearing false witness. Number nineteen is alcohol. Number twenty is gambling, and the list continues. You can go to my Facebook, and there, or you can go to my Pinterest. Pinterest is easier. you go to the pinterest and the various boards one of the boards is on major sin and i have listed all the 70 major sins as per imam al dhahabi in order and giving the various hadith and the quranic verses why it's a major sin you can go and you can find out so number one a person should be careful about major sins some of the scholars call it as grave major sin and some scholars have listed more major sins even besides the 70 major sins so some say grave major sin other the major sin then there may be moderate sin minor sin but broadly there is major sin and minor sins so my request to you brother is that go to my facebook identify which are the major sins and number one you have to stop the major sin and repent for the major sin your major sins cannot be washed away by offering salah or by fasting you have to repent and ask for forgiveness and there are five criteria for anyone to repent for any of the major sins he has done number 1 is agree it is wrong number 2 is that he should stop it immediately number 3 he should ask for forgiveness number 4 he should undo it if he can for example if he is robbed stealing is a major sin he should give it back to the rightful owner if he cannot undo it then there is no option number 5 is he should not repeat it again so for your repentance to be accepted 
first you have to agree the sin that you're doing is wrong number one number two you have to stop it immediately number three ask for forgiveness repent to Allah and ask for his forgiveness number four undo it if you can number five not to repeat it again and inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you what we have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman or Rahim he is Ghafur or Rahim and every chapter of the glorious Quran except for chapter number 9 Surah Tawbah it begins with the formula Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the name of Allah most gracious most merciful what we have to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving and irrespective of whatever sin you have done brother irrespective if you ask for forgiveness sincerely Allah will forgive you even if your sins are as high as the mountain Allah will forgive you as long as you ask sincerely and I've mentioned the five criteria the various hadith talking about that where Allah says that all my servants who have sinned the full day if they ask for forgiveness in the night I'll forgive them all my servants who have sinned the full night in the morning if they ask for forgiveness I'll forgive them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are various hadith Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last one third of the night he comes down at the lower heaven and he asks is there anyone who asked for anything and I will give him is there anyone who wants to ask forgiveness I'll forgive him so this is the time where it is recommended that we offer tahajjud so besides offering five times salah see if you don't do the major sin my request to you would be offer five times salah in jamaat in mosque it is a fard if you don't do it it's the fourth major sin if you start offering salah inshallah the connection of Allah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep on increasing and see to it that you also offer the tahajjud the qayamul layl preferably in the last one third of the night and at this time when in your qayam if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness especially in your sujood in the sajda while you prostrate inshallah Allah will forgive you there is a saying there is a scholar who said that a person cannot say that he has tried everything unless he asks Allah in tajud in the last one third of night that means you cannot say that you have tried everything until you have asked Allah in the last one third of night tajud because that's the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts your prayer there are various other occasions for example our beloved Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your prayer one hour after Asr before the Friday ends so on Juma, after Asr before the Maghrib before Friday ends if you ask during that one hour that's an hour for your dua to be accepted for your forgiveness to be accepted so my advice to you would be besides offering five times salah or for tajjud salah even pray during that one hour of Juma, and inshallah you'll find there'll be a world of a difference your iman will increase and please irrespective of what your sins are don't think that your sins are so high that cannot be forgiven because the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far higher than any sinner in the world and there are various hadith you may have heard of the hadith which says that there was a lady who was a prostitute and she gave water to a thirsty dog and Allah liked that one act of that lady and forgave all the sins and put her in Jannah imagine one act we have the other hadith where a lady was, was a practicing Muslim but she did not treat the cat justly she used to tie and did not give food because of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put her in hell and there's a hadith of a Prophet وسلم, who said that there is a person who does all the evils in the world so much so that he is one arm's length from the hell and he does a good deed Allah likes it and Allah puts him in Jannah there is a person who has done all good deeds in his life so much so that he is one 
arm's length from heaven, from Jannah. And he does an evil deed and Allah puts him in Jahannam, puts him in hell. So this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That even if you have done as many sins that are possible, more than a mountain, if you ask for sincere forgiveness, inshallah Allah will forgive you. So my request to you brother is that see to it that you read more books, try and find out which are the major sins, try and avoid the major sin, and after you stop the major sins, try and avoid even the minor sins, alhamdulillah, but avoiding the major sins is a must, asking the for forgiveness for these is a must, and inshallah, inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he, that he puts you on the Sirat al-Mustaqeem and forgives all your sins and inshallah, inshallah, make you a practicing Muslim so that inshallah, Allah puts you in Jannah, inshallah. We have on the Facebook, Muhammad Arfin Raza, Akib Azad, Kakamin Sabar, Zakaria Zaki, Muhammad Shaheen Alam, Aryan Jovil, Aryan Jovil, Akram Khan, Muhammad Kamzi Kamara, Muhammad Faridul Islam, Afridi Mondal, I love you, sir, I love you too, Saima Ahmed. Hafiz Kanisa Tahmid Zarif Afridi Mondal We have on the YouTube Noor Amin Mustafa Ahmed Aqa Sheikh Muhammad K Abdullah Abshar Sayyid Sayyid Mazin, Muhammad Sharif, Kamran Ali, Samad Meman, Siddiqui Pranto, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam, Jadakallah for your duas. Next question, I am Muntazir from Hyderabad, India. Is it fair and just if a non-Muslim does countless major sins and after he accepts Islam, all of them are forgiven? The question asks is that is it justified and fair if a non-Muslim does countless major sins and if he accepts Islam, all are forgiven? And the question is correct, that whenever a mushrik or a non-Muslim accepts Islam, all his previous sins are forgiven. All his good work is there, all his previous sins are forgiven. Not only are the previous sins forgiven, the more evil and the sins he did, when he accepts Islam, all that is converted to positive. Alhamdulillah. Regarding the question, is it fair, is it justified? Yes, it is justified. Because here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a person is a non-Muslim and if he's doing sin of having alcohol, of gambling, of doing shirk and once he comes close to Islam, he realizes the haqq, he realizes that there's no God worthy of worship except Allah and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger of Allah and he follows the advice, of course. And this is the moment he accepts, imagine, because to leave the previous way of life is very difficult. For a person 
who is born and he's, he's a non-Muslim for many years, maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. He led his life and then he realizes the truth for him to leave it requires a lot of courage, it requires a lot of guts, it requires a lot of passion. So that's the reason when a person agrees what he's doing wrong and he accepts the fold of Islam and says the Shahada, all his previous sins are forgiven. And it's very difficult for a person who has been brought up like a non-Muslim having alcohol, gambling, telling lies, doing wrong things and then to leave all this is very difficult. So, according to me, it is justified. And that doesn't mean that a Muslim, if he does sin, he will not be forgiven. If you heard my previous answer, where one of the Muslim brothers asked, he has done many major sins and he has sinned, what to do? I told him, ask for forgiveness. So, not that you have to be a non-Muslim to have all your sins forgiven. Even if you are a Muslim and you have done something wrong and I have done major sin, all you have to do is ask for sincere forgiveness. And as I mentioned in my earlier answer, for sincere repentance and forgiveness, there are five criteria. Number one, you may have done countless number of sins. What you should do? Agree that thing is wrong. Uh, agree that what you are doing is wrong. Number one. Number two, you stop it. Number three, ask for forgiveness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, undo it if you can. If you have robbed, and you can return the thing you have robbed, okay, return it back. Number five is that do not do it in future. So besides Allah giving an opportunity for the non-Muslim to forgive all the sins, even the Muslims can be forgiven. And if you have heard my earlier answer, the details are given, how to ask for forgiveness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman or Rahim is giving us hundreds of opportunity, thousands of opportunity for Allah to forgive our sins if we have done any. And He is giving us thousands of opportunity to enter Jannah. So this life, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah has created death and life to Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. So Allah has made this life as a test for the hereafter. And we should follow the commandments of Allah and follow His guidance and inshallah all of us who follow his guidance will be inshallah put into Jannah. Hope that answers the question. The next question. <coughs> <coughs> Noor Ashraf from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. After doing the ruku, when we stand, should we again tie our hands or should we keep them free at the sides? The question posed by Noor Ashraf is that after we get up from the ruku in our salah, should we tie our hands? on the chest or should we keep it at the sides? Regarding where should we keep our hands after we get up from the ruku, according to majority of the scholars, after you get up from ruku, we should keep our hands on the sides. According to Imam Abu Hanifa, according to Imam Malik, according to Imam Shafi, the view is that we should keep our hands at the sides after we get up from Ruku. As far as the view of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal is concerned, he had two views that if you want, you can keep it at the side. If you want to tie it on the chest, keep it on the chest, even that is permissible. There, yet, there are some scholars who say that after Ruku, the hands should be kept on the chest. This they derive, there are various hadiths we say that in the ruku your hand should be on the knee, in the sujood your hand should be on the ground, in julus while sitting for tayyat you keep your hands on your thighs, in qayam your hand 
your right hand should be above your left forearm. And this all of us agree, all the Muslims agree, there are various say hadith which says that in Qayyam, your right hand should be above your left forearm. This is Allah. Now, majority of the scholars, what they say, in Qayyam, yes, we have to keep your right hand over the left hand. But when we get up from Ruku, that is not Qayyam. The other scholars, though minority number, what they say that when you get up from Ruku, when you stand up, even that is Qayyam. So here the scholars differ, majority, they say that when you get up from Ruku, that is not part of Qayyam. It is just in between portion after getting up from Ruku and before going into Sajda. But the other group, which is a minority, they say no, even this is Qayyam, therefore we are going to keep our right hand over the left hand. Further it is mentioned in the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number 1, Hadith number 8 to 8, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he got up from the Ruku, his vertebra came back to the normal position. That when the Prophet got up from the Ruku, he stood up and his vertebra came to the normal position. There's one more hadith in Sunan Ibn Majah, or number one, hadith number 863, where it says that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he got up from his ruku, all his bone returned to its position. Now, the majority of the scholars who say that the hand should be kept on the side, they said yes. Here it says the bones returned to its original position. That is the normal position at the side. The other group we say that it returned to the original position means where were the bones before the person went into Ruku? It was on the chest. But what they fail to realize that the first hadith of Bukhari, it says in the normal position, the vertebra at the backbone will go to the normal position. So this hadith also when it says returns, it means return to the normal position, not the position before, the normal position. And the normal position is hands on the side. So here the scholars are divided. Among the scholars who say that the hand should be kept on the chest, right over the left forearm, right hand over the left forearm, after you get up from Ruku, are scholars like Sheikh bin Baz, Sheikh Utaymi, these scholars say that your hand should be on the chest after Ruku. But according to Sheikh Nasruddin Albani, he says no. If you read his book on the Prophet's prayer, he says that there is no hadith at all. There is no evidence from, from the Messenger of Allah or from any of the Sahabas that after Ruku you have to keep the hand on the chest. And he categorically says that it should be on the side. To give the answer, this is a very minor issue. And I feel that it's a minor issue, though the majority of the scholars say that it should be at the side. But if someone keeps on the chest, it is not a major issue, not that the salah will not be accepted, or it's just a minor issue. So those people who keep on the side should not criticize those people who keep the hands on the chest after getting him from Ruku. And those who keep it on the chest should not criticize those people who are keeping on the sides. But Regarding the question, the majority of the fuqahs and the scholars, all the first three emmas and, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, may Allah be, Allah have mercy on him, according to Nasrul al-Bani, though he said that you can keep the hands on the sides or on the chest, he always kept it on the side, according to Nasrul al-Bani. So he said that was his opinion, but his practice was keeping on the sides, and that is the correct opinion according to Nasrul al-Bani. But whatever the difference is there, we Muslims should not fight over it. It's a minor issue. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. I am Samoun from Haura, West Bengal, India. My question is, can we greet a non-Muslim teacher with good morning? or good afternoon when he or she arrives in the classroom. 
as far as wishing good morning to a non-Muslim teacher or good afternoon, it is perfectly fine in Islam. As long as the greeting is good, you can wish any greeting which is good and it should not be against the Sharia. So good morning is a good greeting. It may not be the best, but it's permissible. So if the teacher comes and you wish any greeting as long as it is not against the Sharia, and it's a good greeting, you can wish. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 86, وَإِذَا حُيِّتُمْ بِتَّهِيَتٍ فَحَيُّ بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَانَ عَلَيْقُ لِشَيْنْ حَسِيبًا Which means that if anyone greets you or wishes you courteously, wish back more courteously or at least the same. For Allah is careful in keeping of accounts. So, greeting is good. As far as greeting getting the Muslims are concerned, Allah also says in the Quran that whenever you meet a believer, say Salaamu Alaikum. Whenever you meet those people who believe in the signs of Allah, wish them Salaamu Alaikum. And there are various hadith. So for a Muslim, it is compulsory when he meets another Muslim, he should say Assalamu Alaikum. But if you are meeting a non-Muslim, if you say good morning, there is no problem at all. Between the two greetings, there is a world of reference. What does Islam recommend? Is Assalamu Alaikum. May peace be on you. If you compare this greeting with the greeting of the non-Muslim or the Westerner, that is good morning, you know, the teacher is coming to your class. The teacher may have had a fight with his wife and he may be cursing the morning. But when he comes to the class, all the students say, Good morning, sir. Imagine he had a fight with his wife. He may be cursing that morning. He may be wishing that this morning doesn't come again and the students are wishing him good morning. In case of the Islamic greeting, may peace be on you, Irrespective whether it's a good morning or a bad morning, whether it is raining cats or dogs, whether, whether a person had a fight with a wife or not, may peace be on you is excellent. Even if it is a happy morning, peace be on you is good. Even if it is a sad morning, peace be on you is good. So the Islamic greeting is more practical and more appropriate. And further it says in the Quran, Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 86, if someone wishes you, wish back more courteously. For example, if someone says, Assalamu alaikum, you have to wish back, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. If someone says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you have to wish back, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Or if someone wishes, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh, if you cannot improve it, at least wish back the same, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Or maybe, someone says, Assalamu alaikum, and you can reply with, Walaikum as -salam. The words are the same, but you know, the emotion is there. So, even this is better. So, Allah advises in the Quran, if someone wishes you, wish back more courteously or at least the same. So, but naturally, as we discuss, Assalamu Alaikum is a universal greeting, is much better. And this was the greeting used even by Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If you read the Bible in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, goes to the upper room and he meets the apostle, he says, Shalom Alaikum, peace be on you. Same thing. In Hebrew, Shalom Alaikum. In Arabic, Assalamu Alaikum. And if suppose someone wishes you good morning, your reply should be very good morning. Because very good morning is better than good morning. Or least you can do is you can wish back good morning. So if the teacher comes and wishes you good morning, it's preferable for you to reply a very good morning or at least the same. So these are the guidance given in the Quran that the Islamic greeting is far superior but there is no problem wishing any other greeting as long as it is not against the Sharia. There may be certain greetings which may be against the Sharia. For example, in, in Hindu culture, they say Namaste. Now Namaste means I bow to you. This is not correct. So you cannot repeat that Namaste. Saying good morning no problem, good afternoon no problem. But saying Namaste meaning I bow down to you. Idam Namame coming from the Sanskrit word Idam Namame. So this you cannot say. 
But other greeting, as long as it is not against the Sharia, it's not against Quran and Hadith. If it is a good greeting, you can wish, there is no problem at all. The next question from Firoz from Zurich, Switzerland. I am a big fan of you and may Allah bless you. Jazakallah shukran. Ameen. I want to ask you regarding interest as these days it's difficult to avoid getting interest from the bank and also to pay by credit cards. If I get interest but I don't eat it, instead I use it to pay my bills like repairs and electricity and salaries etc. Is it okay or is it haram? The Firoz from Zurich has asked a question, it's very difficult to strive from riba, from interest, there's credit cards. But if I get the interest, is it okay if I don't eat it, but pay, use it for paying my electric bills, my telephone bills, etc. Many people have a misconception that what is prohibited is not to eat food from the interest money. Not to eat food from the interest money is prohibited, but interest per se is haram. And there are no less than eight times in the Quran where Allah uses the word riba, interest, and it is mentioned as haram. And the most strictest warning is in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 278 and 279, where Allah says that if you give up not your demands of riba, then take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. That means if you give up not your demand from riba, that you involve, you indulge in interest in riba, in usury, then Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. According to Imam Madhabi, it is the twelfth major sin in Islam. Giving interest is haram, taking interest is also haram. Both are haram. And regarding a question, if interest is haram, can I pay my electric bill? If you are paying your electric bill, it's benefiting you. That you don't have to pay electricity bill, you don't have to pay telephone bill. It is not permitted at all. Even if you take interest and give in charity to others, generally according to me, it's not permitted. Yes, if you have taken interest unknowingly and today you realize it is wrong, it is haram. And then you say, I will not keep in the saving account. I will not keep in fixed deposit account. And now I'll stop it. And then if you have some interest money, that you can give in charity. You cannot use it for yourself, neither for eating food, neither for any benefit, neither for paying electric bill or any other bill, you cannot use it on yourself or on any of your duties. You can however give it as charity to other people or for building toilets etc. But you cannot keep on keeping in the bank and every year taking the interest and giving in charity even that is wrong because Allah says in the Quran taking interest is haram. When you giving in charity first you have to take and then give. So even giving charity regularly according to me is prohibited. Yes, if you were involving in riba and you realize today it is haram and if you have some money that you can give in charity, don't utilize on yourself or you can build toilets with it but continuously doing that and giving in charity according to me even that's not permitted. Hope that's the question. The next question Next question from Next question is from Aisha Munir from Lahore, Pakistan. I am a housewife. I completed Master's in Business Administration, that is MBA. I want to know as a Muslim woman, what profession should I adopt? I want to contribute to society in a better way. 
I don't want to die as a common person. Sister Aisha Munir has asked a very important question that she has done an MBA, Master's in Business Administration. She does not want to die as a common person. She says what profession she, she takes so that she benefits the Ummah. As far for a lady, the best and the most important work and profession is that of a mother. Number one, that if you are a mother, you should see to it that you are a very good mother to your children because you are going to build the next generation. And as Allah SWT says in the Quran that take, you take care of yourself and your family and save them from the hellfire. And the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that a leader of the Ummah should take care of his flock. A man who's head of the family should take care of his family and a woman should see to it that the husbands and her children that are there, she takes care of the children. So based on this, number one, the most important is that for a woman, she should be a good mother. Besides being a mother or if you're not married, the best profession that you can take, according to me, is of a dai. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ ضَائِلَ اللَّهِ وَآمِلُ صَالِحَهُمْ وَقَالَ إِنَّنِ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of the Lord, works righteousness and says that I'm Muslim. So the best profession for any Muslim, whether man or woman, it is to become a dai. Calling people to the way of Allah is the best profession. And even if you're able to make one non-Muslim accept Islam, it is a great thing. As the Blood Prophet said, as though it's like a red camel. You know, the red camel is the most treasured thing for the Arabs at that time, like a Rose Royal. So number one is the profession of a dai. Try and invite people, the non-Muslim friends, the non-Muslim ladies that you have to the fold of Islam. Number two would be for a lady is to do the profession of an Islamic teacher. She can be an Islamic teacher maybe for the ladies in a ladies Islamic university. Can be for a lady, can be in a ladies college. She can be an Islamic teacher in the school. Maybe for the girls in the secondary school or in the primary school, maybe for all the children, for all the students. So next best is the profession of Islamic teacher. Number two, motherhood is there. After motherhood, number one is Dai. Number two is uh, being Islamic teacher. Number three is being a doctor or being a gynecologist. Because if a woman becomes a gynecologist, a gynecologist is the doctor of the ladies, she is preventing many of her Muslim sisters from making the hijab. It is always advisable that a woman when she goes to see a doctor for a health problem, she should go to a lady doctor. And we have less lady doctors today in the world, so it is a good opportunity that you can become a lady doctor and prevent the hijab from being broken for many of your sisters. Number four, that in the medical profession, you can be a pediatrician, that is a doctor for the children and treat them. Number five is you can become a counsellor and normally it is good for a counsellor to be a lady and it's very much possible that you can be a counsellor for the, for the children and you can guide them as per the Quran and Sunnah. The next would be you can become a, a pediatrician 
a doctor for the for the ladies, number for the children. A gynecologist among the medical profession number one is gynecologist for a lady. Second can be a pediatrician. Third can be a general physician for the ladies because it is preferable that a lady goes to a lady and a gent goes to a gent if they are sick. Like in Bombay, where we had the medical center where we used to give free treatment, we had two different entrances, one for the gents, one for the ladies. And for the gents, we had a gent doctor full time. For the ladies, we had a lady doctors. The children had option to go wherever they wanted. And we saw to it that there was complete hijab in the ladies section. And it was, I, it was, I don't know of any other exclusive medical center anywhere in India, which is ladies doctor is the only for ladies and gent doctor only for gents. But this is what Asharia says. So you can become a doctor. After that, you can take up other professions, like be a businessman, etc. Sorry, you can become a businesswoman. What you have to realize that if you take any other profession, see to it that that profession is not against the Quran and Sunnah. It should not be against the teaching of the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith. But as I mentioned, the best is being a mother. And the next would be taking up the profession which gets the person closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one is a da'i. Number two is an Islamic teacher. These things will get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the other profession comes being a doctor or doing business, etc. Hope that answers the question. Time is running short. We'll have only time to take one more question. And this will be the last question for this session. My name is Khalid. I am from India and I'm currently residing in Saudi Arabia. I am an IT networking and security engineer. I am working in one private bank in Saudi Arabia. I'm not involved in interest riba, but I'm working in the back end of the bank which means a network engineer. Am I doing a sin and am I doing a war with Allah by working as a network engineer as work, by working as a network engineer in a conventional bank? As far as working in a bank for a Muslim is concerned, working in a bank on any position it is haram if you're working in a business in which the core activity is haram then working in that company in any position is prohibited since riba is the 12th major sin in islam you cannot work in any position neither as a network engineer neither as a manager neither as a clerk neither neither as a person on the cashier counter neither in security all is prohibited because the core activity is prohibited similarly you cannot work in alcoholic company in any position you cannot work as a manager of alcohol company you cannot work as a doorman you cannot work as a driver all is haram if you are working in a company in which a small percentage of the activity is haram and you are not directly involved in that activity then it is permitted. For example, if you are working in a five-star hotel, and in a five-star hotel, they serve alcohol in the bar, in the restaurant. So you cannot work in the bar, in the restaurant and serve alcohol, that is prohibited. But surely you can work as a receptionist in the five-star hotel, because that's permitted. As long as you don't work directly into the haram activity, a small portion, and the income from alcohol in a five-star hotel is negligible. It's a small percentage. So if you're working in a company in which small percentage of the activity is haram, see to it you are not directly involved in that activity, that is permitted. But don't get involved in the activity directly. But if you're working in a company in which the major activity is haram, like working in a bank, conventional bank, which is based on riba, or working in an alcoholic company, 
this is haram in any position even as a network engineer this was the last question that we can entertain and inshallah we will meet next sunday we will meet next saturday at the same time that is in malaysia 11:30 in the makkah time is 6:30 and gmt is 3:30 for the next session of ask dr zakir till we meet next week assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin